It is now my privilege to introduce our commencement speaker, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Ron Suskind. A graduate of the University of Virginia and Columbia University School of Journalism, Mr. Suskind began his career at the Wall Street Journal, where he became senior national affairs reporter in 1993. In 1995, he wrote a two-part series on an inner-city student in Washington, D.C., who had aspirations of attending a top-tier college. These articles earned Mr. Suskind the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Since leaving the Wall Street Journal in 2000, Mr. Suskind has written articles for venues such as the New York Times Magazine and Esquire, and among the subjects of these articles were the inner workings of the White House in both the Bush and Obama administrations. His subsequent three books, The Price of Loyalty, The One Percent Doctrine, and The Way of the World, all addressed aspects of the George W. Bush administration, while a fourth book, Confidence Men, took a look at the first two years of the Obama administration. Mr. Suskind's most recent book, Life Animated, takes his work in an entirely different direction. It is a memoir covering 20 years of family life with his younger son, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Mr. Suskind has been interviewed about these books on numerous national television and radio programs, and it is truly an honor to have him with us here today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Suskind. Wait, this podium doesn't work for someone my height. I don't I feel like Danny DeVito here. With me. <laughs> this is better, this is better. And I'm gonna take the hat off too, because hats don't work with this nose, ever. So, <laughs> don't work. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I, I first want to congratulate all of the people in the shade. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> but I pity you, all of you, because you are not graced with the adversity that the rest of us are sharing here. Now, I'll throw out one of my favorite first lines. Uh, some of you who are English majors may know this one, but it's one that I've learned over my life, has enormous resilience. It's from Shakespeare's As You Like It, where he says at one point, sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, bears a precious jewel in its forehead. So much of this life is fine in that damn jewel. It's what great things emerge from. There ain't no doubt. You know, I was standing with uh, my new friend here, uh, uh, John Quessel. Am I getting it right? Your, your associate de uh, dean here. Smart guy, mathematician. And, and we were standing over there where all of you were proceeding in. And he said, we were here four years ago when they all proceeded as well, but they look different then. <laughs> I love that. You bet you did. You bet. And he told me something else was fascinating. Now, I don't know if you can do this here, but he says that on your IDs, do you all have that freshman picture? Oh, my word. <laughs> I, can I ask you, this, can everyone take their IDs out here? You don't have it? Some of you, at least some of you. It's like an experiment. This is nice. This is kind of like Oprah. We're going to hug and cry. <laughs> now, I want you, those who have the ideas, to look at that picture. Oh, my. How very much has changed. <laughs> and as well, I want you to look into the eyes of that person as they look at you now. What would they say? What would they think? What were they thinking about their hair? <laughs> I want to go back to that day briefly before I have you put your IDs away. Because uh, you guys, I, you folks are just so lucky here. I mean, all manner of serendipity is working for you. I know that we got a nice breeze too, that's working. And because I mean, my goodness, Lewis and Clark, you know, you are at a college. I, I believe there's not a college in America, and I teach at Harvard, that is more appropriately named for all the searches that we prize, that we love. I mean, you're here at Lewis and Clark, arguably, you know, the, the, the quintessence of what works in American education. One thing that actually works in this country, small liberal arts colleges. You all chose right. <laughs> There 
hour lectures at Ohio State with like everyone here in them times three. <laughs> and you also pick right in another way because there is no better time to have a graduation than on Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> Two big moments of serendipity. And I just want to mention the moms here briefly. Because I've studied this as a, yeah, thank, thank, thank you. My mother is here in the audience. <laughs> it's not my mother, it's your mother's. Because that opening day is a crucial American day four years ago. We want to mention that briefly to get a sense of distance traveled. I mean, you know, it's as close to a, a biblical day as we get in America. Lech Lecha is what God says to Abraham. Go forth. But to where? God doesn't say. This is a Lech Lecha moment. The parents drive up, this great procession, this big misty procession on opening day. You remember it four years ago? It's like a great choreographed bonanza because they all move in a kind of unison. You know, if you remember, your mom was looking at you with a kind of crazy intensity, remember? <laughs> like you're going to vanish at any minute. And if your dad got emotional, um, usually he does what we tend to do, we guys, is he looks at his watch. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I should be somewhere else, I think, now. <laughs> and then the key moment, the key moment on opening day is around 2 o'clock, most colleges. All the moms move in unison, however many there are. Could be 1,000, could be 2,000, could be 5,000. And they all, at the same instant, make the bed. Am I right? How many mothers here made that bed on opening day? Let's see a show of hands. Now, what's amazing is you didn't even go into their room in high school. That was just keep the door shut. But at this moment, all the mothers make the bed. And they make it with a kind of clarity of purpose. You know, the, the smoothing of the sheets, the tucking of the corner. Four or five folds in that hospital corner. You know, the defense department could requisition that. How did they do that? Shh. That bed is made so tight you could bounce a quarter right to the ceiling off it. Now, I asked a friend of mine in Washington, a psychiatrist, what's going on with the mothers in the bed? He's a British guy. He says, hey, well, you see, the bed, is all sorts of things are wrapped up in that bed. You see, they make it like that. It's very tight, you see to protect the child against the demons of college life. <laughs> sex, it's always about sex, isn't it? You can't get in that bed, much less bring anyone with you. <laughs> but, but. Now, of course, we don't need to consult a psychiatrist to know why the mom spent a half an hour making that bed. It's, it's because it's the last thing they do. After a whole life of doing. And after that, there's nothing left really to do. <laughs> and then four years later, they come back. And none of you made your beds for four years. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Because you're up and you're out. And they're here to wish you well. They're here to look at you just like they did, but even more so. They're looking at you now with that same crazy gaze, aren't they? Hi, honey. <laughs> just, you look. <laughs> <laughs> and the dads, too. You know, I'll just say briefly, uh, as a dad, I just want to give, uh, give some due to the dads. If this happened in June, we'd be doing this on Father's Day, and it would be all about the dads. But we're not. It's May, and it's the mom. So let me just say that one of the roles of the dads, which flows right to your day to day, is generally, generally, not always, but generally, it's the dad who helped you ride the bike the first time. Am I right? Now, I did that with my son, my autistic son, where there are interesting challenges. And I remember it was a hot day in Washington, and I ran behind him. You hold the seat, and you run. Like this, in a, like a wild sand crab move. You're low and you're running. And after half an hour of this, I'm realizing it's not working. And what's happening is he's riding. 
he's saying, are you holding me? And I say, I'm holding you. And as soon as I let go, he says, you're holding me, and I grab it again. So I'm realizing uh, I'm going to have to lie to him. And parents will do this from time to time. So after half an hour as we're running, are you holding me? I'm holding you. Are you holding? I'm holding you. I'm holding you. I'm holding you. And he looks over. And he has a look, which I know you all know. A look of fear and freedom. <laughs> and I yell the one thing, two words, upon which the whole culture rests, that the parents all yell, keep pedaling! <laughs> So I want to tell you that we're all saying that right now, all these people here. We're saying, and they're saying the two things that the parents say, and they're all, all you want to really hear from them anyway, just two things. I love you, and I'm proud of you. That's pretty much it, because that's kind of all that matters. And keep pedaling. But remember, please, to park the bike up ahead to lie under the willow and feel the breeze. Just do it. Remember once in a while to look back where all of them will be sitting and, and waving. Hey. Yeah. Look, I could tell you all sorts of things about presidents I've interviewed and, and what they've said that has been not true. <laughs> Excuse me, may I hug you? I want to hug you. <laughs> I've had some wrestling matches with him. You can read about that on Wikipedia. I'm not going to tell you much, except I'm going to say in the great battles that envelop us publicly, they're really all the same battle throughout time, really. It's about embracing the outlier, about bringing in those who've been excluded, who are just visiting, who want to be a part. Those who are already at the table, already a part, are a little tetchy about this usually. <laughs> Not enough seats. Buying a bigger table, who's got that kind of money? But that's pretty much all the struggles in one single thing. And we always move forward when we say we can make this table bigger. Let's bring in these people with their nose pressed against the window, these people who are not like us. Let's find the shared humanity, because it is shared. In every essential way, we are all identical. We are, in all the things a human being wants, and you know it, and we all do. So let me tell you about, very briefly, about the three best teachers I ever had. Now, I had great teachers in college. No doubt about it. And these are extraordinary scholars, and you actually get to meet them here. Some universities, uh, well, they're only uh, that big because that's how far away you are from the stage. But you get to mix with scholars, and it's a gift. It's what makes us better. And you've learned how to learn. Now the question is, what will you learn? So my three best teachers. Mm hmm Boom, boom, boom. First, a guy who sends me a letter when I'm 14 years old. The letter on the second page, a handwritten letter, has got an urgency to it. Where this, this guy writing this letter says, one thing I'll ask of you. Life is precious. Time is so precious. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Something you can be proud of. Don't compromise there. And if you keep that the star at the center of your constellation, everything else will work out. Trust me. You don't get letters like that much. But if you go to the first page, you'll see why it was being written. So the first sentence is, I hope you two boys never read this letter but I cannot ignore what the doctors have said. That's from my dad. 
says, it just crushes me to know I will not be here to see you become man. But listen, there are values in our home, and if you have those values and you hold tight to them, you'll have almost everything you need. He says something interesting. He says, uh, and, and remember this, you boys don't owe me and your mother anything. You have given us more by being a presence on our life than we ever possibly could give to you. My mother disagrees with that almost at every level. <laughs> you owe me big. She's a little person from Brooklyn. This tall. No surprise they're going to make. They're both right. They're both right. I owe them big. But worthwhile. That's a high bar. My education leaves forward. As has been mentioned, when I realized I've got an autistic son, and all the things, I have two boys. My son Owen is three when he is hit with autism. I've got an older son, Walter, who's five. And at that point, I was thinking, two kids? Well, that's going to be two presidents. And after that, Nobel Prizes, because they had to get their Olympic medal first. And They all carry that stuff around. They don't even recognize it. We all do. But I had to pull all those out and smash them in the corner. And I couldn't manage to think, my wife and I, what a future looks like. He's silent for years. He's deemed ineducable. He's in the discard pile. Truly. He gets thrown out of a school, and he tries to make his way. Now, the twist of the story is that though he could not speak for years, um, he was watching uh, all of the Disney animated movies, truly. And he memorized them all, silently. I know, Disney, believe it or not, Disney. <laughs> 50 of them have been made since Snow White in 1937, 50 of them. He memorized them all. And all of a sudden, when he's silent at seven, we realize if you threw him a line, he'd throw you back to the next line. It's amazing. So our first conversation, what, have you ever seen the movie Aladdin? Anyone you see that movie here? Okay. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. You're in the community that watched that movie with the little clamshell box. So our first conversation is, is me as Yago, that's Gilbert Godfrey, and Owen as Jafar. And off we go. He learns to speak by speaking in Disney dialogue over years, and then he writes an extraordinary aria. Once he gets speech back, He's autistic, he'll be autistic for the rest of his life. But what I realized, what we all realized, is he was teaching us, changing us, helping us see something bigger than we were taught in college or taught by the meritocracy that rewarded us. Things so come to their fullness. He writes a little story that'll soon be produced as a little movie. It's about a boy at three who was struck by some mysterious disease. It's when he was hit with autism and leaves his home after a storm rises from the horizon, crosses a bridge that collapses behind him, and finds himself, finds himself in a forest, a forest of the lost sidekicks. Sidekicks. You know sidekicks. There's zillions of them in Disney. Merlin, Rafiki, Jiminy Cricket. They help the hero fulfill their destiny. That's their role. That's their job. So Owen ends up in the land of the lost side. He says, why are they lost? He says, their heroes have already fulfilled their destiny. They have no purpose. They take the boy and it's one of their own, a sidekick he. It's where he lives. And that's where my son actually did live for 10 years in his head. But he said, there is evil in this forest, he writes. Real villains, and they'll have to face them without heroes. So what do they do? They look for the qualities of the hero in each other. Though they're ever sidekicks, you don't get redrawn in this life. You summon the hero each day on your best days. One. You heard about my father. That's two. Last story. Something I'll tell you to do, each of you. Talk to cab drivers. I mean, uh, yeah. I stopped doing it at some point. I got kind of self-important. I said, no, 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 I'm a big shot now. I need to talk to cab drivers. 
And I was having one of those big shot moments. <laughs> Fool that I am. I flew into Washington one morning, and I had to, had to actually uh, go back from the airport, Reagan National, and I had about two hours at the house, and then I had to catch another flight at 12 o'clock. In at 8, out at 12. Now I'm in the cab, and I'm calling for the other cab while I'm in the cab, a sedan. Now the cab driver turns to me when I hang up the phone. He says, so how much? He's, he's Somalian. How much is he charging you? The guy you just called. I said, 109 bucks. I can do it for 60. I said, what do you mean do it for 60? Well you, well, you have to come back to my house in two hours. What will you do for the next two hours? I'll get breakfast. So all of a sudden, I'm talking to a cab driver again. So he comes back in two hours, and we start to talk. He said, let me tell you, let me tell you, Mr. Ron, my story. He said, OK. Want to reward entrepreneurial spirit? And I do. And he starts to tell me. He says, I'm from Somalia. It's a tough country, and I, I have lived a difficult life. I was on the junior soccer team in Somalia, and uh, so I had a passport that could get me out of the country, and I borrowed as much money as I could. And I got out of the country, enough for a plane ticket, just enough. I end up in New York in January, a freezing day. I am dressed like an African man. I have no English. I wander Kennedy Airport. I don't know where I'm going. I have uh, just a piece of paper with the address of the person I must see in Northern Virginia. And I see a desk, uh, a, a desk with two big A's. And I say, this must be good, American Airlines. <laughs> I go to the desk. I see beyond the desk is a big fat man, a big fat American man. He's like the size of four African men. <laughs> I stand there, he looks at me, I look at him, I take the piece out of, the pocket, out of my pocket, I give him the piece of paper, he looks at the paper, he goes, hmm. And then he says, hmm, I know what this means. This is a universal sign. I reach into my pocket and I give him five dollars. <laughs> I don't know how the money works. He looks at the five dollars, he looks at me, he goes, hmm. And, and then we just stand there, the two of us, me and the fat man. And then he reaches into a pocket, he puts a piece of plastic. And I've never seen one of these. And he goes, Phew. and he hands me a ticket. And I know something extraordinary has happened. I cannot speak any English, so I try to thank him with my eyes. And then I go to Northern Virginia. I meet the guy from the soccer team. He works at the Pizza Hut. I worked at the Pizza Hut for three years. I eat pizza morning, noon, and night. Every meal, only pizza. <laughs> I go to a college, George Mason University at night. I'm good in math. I meet a woman from Somalia. We have children. One of them is winning a math competition. I've got a life. And it's all because of the fat man. <laughs> what would have happened? It was six degrees in New York. I was wearing nothing. I would have frozen. Years later, I went back to Kennedy Airport to look for him. I spent two days in the airport. I couldn't find him. I walked and walked. No fat man. But then an amazing thing happened to me just a month ago. I was in the cab line at National Airport. And I'm creeping my way up. And I get to the end. And I see at the end, there's a little man. He is a little man with a big bag. And he comes out. He's a Vietnamese man. He, I see it says Saigon. And I look at him, he looks at me, and he has a piece of paper. He hands it to me. I open it up. It's an address way in Virginia. It's two hours. So I say, it's this universal sign. He reaches to his pocket, he's got one dollar. <laughs> I had five times what he had. <laughs> So I say, get it. And we drive way into Virginia. Far, so far. We get to a little nothing, a little house, a trailer house. We pull up, and all of a sudden the door flies open, and a little woman runs out, a little Vietnamese woman. She's only this big. And she is, runs low. She's a low runner. She runs fast. <laughs> Must be his mother. And she hugs him. 
And then he turns to me. And I can see he is trying to thank me with his eyes. And I think of the fat man. Now I am the fat man. <laughs> I feel him in me. And I look at him and I say, now it's your turn. Graduates of this extraordinary college, about to break free into the world, now it is your turn. Make it all better. Reach for the high arc. Live the fullest life you can imagine. And remember always to look back where they'll all be standing there saying, I love you and I'm proud of you. Congratulations.